Welcome back to Creative New Mexico Live. I'm Angela Shen. And I'm Ebony Romero. We have a very exciting show today featuring Christopher president of Incredible Films, a community-based independent film production company. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, join us on Periscope and ask us and we may feature them live. Christopher grew up in El Valle Arroyo de Seco and attended the University of Southern California where he graduated with degrees in cinema, television, and communication. Afterwards, he came back to New Mexico and founded Incredible Films. His most recent film is featured Siempre Flamenco and features local world-class flamenco artists of, based out of the National Institute of Flamenco. Christopher takes pride in using his filmmaking and photography skills to capture the essence of New Mexico and its people. So thank you so much for being here with us Yay. today. So You're first welcome. of all, we wanted to know like, what kind of sparked your interest in filmmaking and entrepreneurship? Um, well, for me, it all begins with the story. Um, first and foremost, my passion is writing. That's probably what I'm best at in life. And so um, I've been writing throughout my, my life, probably since I was like 10 and 11, that sort of thing. So when it came to going to college, and I knew I was going to the University of Southern California, I planned to actually study journalism. Um, and so I went there to study broadcast journalism because I wanted to do kind of what you're doing right now, <laughs> interview people live, yeah. and do that sort of thing. <clears throat> and so then when I got out to, um, to Southern Cal, I kind of just thought, well, what would it be like to take other sort of writing classes? And that got me to screenwriting. Um, and basically, once I took my first screenwriting class, I was like, this is, I'm hooked. This is what I want to mm -hmm. do. Um, you know, I want to continue to figure out what it's like to make movies, how to do it. And so that led me on my path to learning how to write and direct and produce and shoot and edit. Um, and I just threw everything into it. So over the last 10 years, that's been my main focus, is developing my company, Incredible Films, and just really trying to stay busy and produce a lot of work. I don't like to have downtime. I like to, to really just jump in and make a lot of different projects and learn. Um, and so that's it all began there, and my passion has just kind of grown since that that point, I guess. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So yeah. uh, you said you were totally into writing. Before, when you were younger, did you ever think that you would have gotten as into producing and filmmaking as before? Uh, yeah. Did you ever think you would get into that, like, as you are now? That's a good question. I think... I don't think it was even something on my radar like yeah. I ever thought about until I like took that first screenwriting class and then I was like, I really like writing films. Yeah. And then the, the, the decision for me to go and everything else happened shortly after when I thought, well, I, lo I love this script as much as you can love a script yeah. this much oh, that yeah. I, I don't want to give it away to just anybody. Like I was like, I need to direct this. Like I see it so perfectly. You see how it's supposed to be. Yeah, and I just couldn't, I, I, did, I couldn't bear the thought of giving it to somebody else. And so that's the first kind of time in my life where it really became a real consideration. Like, well, maybe I need to learn how to produce and direct and that sort of thing. And, and I've enjoyed all of it. I mean, I, I, I totally enjoy having help. Um, but I tend to operate a lot kind of like as a one-man team or a two-man team. My sister being my co-producer and the main other partner in Incredible Films. Um, and so it's just, it, yeah, it all happened very organically. Yeah. I think in life when you find what you're supposed to do, it, it, is, it does become a little easy. Yeah. Even yeah. though it takes a lot of work, it becomes a little easy because it's something you want to do. And that's how filmmaking has been for me for the most part. Awesome. So what would you say some of your obstacles are? Um, I think probably... As the projects grow in scope and get larger and larger, whether it's I want to you know, spend more time, whether it's weeks, months, years on a project, or involve more people, um, probably the organizational or the fundraising aspects of it are the biggest yeah. challenge, just because there are practical resources you need. Like if you have a bunch of people, you need to at least feed them, if nothing else. You know, If yeah. you can't pay them a day's wage, you have to feed them and you know, do that sort of thing, or rent equipment or buy equipment. And so you know, over 10 years, I've sort of... I've confronted that obstacle by sort of growing slowly. Yeah. Um, where like at first it was like, okay, let's get the bare essentials, like a tripod and a easy and like a simple camera and that sort of thing. And then it was like over time, okay, let's get a microphone and let's get a get lighting kit yeah. and that sort of thing. Because that's always, especially when you're starting off small, when you're starting, I think in any business, if you don't have you know a lot of uh, capital right to begin with you know, that, that challenge is always going to be there to sort of, you know, get the equipment you need, get the equipment you want, yeah. the resources you need and want in order to grow. Um, so I would say that's been the main one, probably. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, like, if you really want to do something this artistically, right. there's not really any obstacle to it unless you allow yourself to, like, yeah. you make yourself your own obstacle. You can find a way to do it. it. Yeah. You can find a way to do it with, you know, the tools and that sort of thing. Um, so I haven't chosen to see 
or complain about at least a lot of other <laughs> right. big obstacles. I'm just trying to, you know, yeah. go out and When and there's do a will, there's a way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's been hopefully the approach I've tried to, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like embrace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So where do you find inspiration for your films and what? how do you decide what topics to explore? Um, regular, everyday people um, I find inspiration in. I think having grown up here in New Mexico, being born and raised in northern New Mexico, I didn't really appreciate it or understand it until I left home. And I think that's yeah. true for, you know, a oh, lot yeah. of people. Unless you totally. leave where you, like, grew up, you don't really see it in an objective way. Right, yeah. Um, and so leaving and being in Southern California, and when it came close to graduating, it was like, well, do I want to stay somewhere like this? Do I want to go to somewhere like New York, a big market, you know, which is more known for, you know, a film center of the world? Or do I want to go back home? Um, and I made a very conscious decision to come back home because I wanted to tell New Mexico stories and I wanted to work with real New Mexicans. Mm-hmm. And I saw, as you all see on a daily basis, even more than you know I saw 10 years ago, that technology is opening up the way we tell stories and the opening up how we connect you know, with each other so much. Like It's, it's yeah. different than ever before. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't want to be limited to just staying in a city like L.A. or New York where it was done one way. I wanted to come to New Mexico and hopefully do something in a different way, start my film career in a different way that I don't encourage other people to like, you know, think of, you know, doing their thing in a different way. Um, and so coming home and then saying I want to commit to New Mexico stories, you know, I found inspiration in things that when I was young were boring to me, mm-hmm. like traditions yeah. and culture and stuff like that. That then I was like, man, there's so many stories to mm-hmm. tell. There's there's all these things that are important and cool and interesting and. Um, it's just you have to be willing to see it as yeah, cool yeah. and interesting and that sort of thing. So I always tell people and ask me what kind of films I make. I say, well, I make films about real people, mostly about New Mexico, mm-hmm. about you know, about New Mexicans, um, and about people who are trying to you know, kind of persevere, mm-hmm. overcome, or you know, embrace a sort of you know, honest kind of open way of living. Mm-hmm. Um, because I feel like art, I feel film, I feel photography can all be a tool. Um, if you choose to make it so. And so that also inspires me, that idea that, you know, positive change can be made through my work, and hopefully it will. Like, I don't really care if I'm remembered when I'm gone, dead and gone, but I'd like the work to still, you know, resonate with people. If, you know, if you have a perfect, in a perfect world, you can't guarantee that, but I mean, (laughs) that'd be nice. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, about funding for your projects, where do you get your funding? And then, to New Mexico, I know that uh, one of the big debates is about uh, how the state should continue to provide tax breaks for those who film here. So mm-hmm. how does that affect you? And of course, how do you get your funding? Yeah, really good question. Um, so as I said, you know, funding it tends to be one of the largest obstacles if you allow it to be, depending on the scope or size of your project. So for me, my films, at least through my early part of my career, I really try to to create them in a way where I knew that funding wasn't, I wasn't going to need a lot to make them. You know, I was going to be like, okay, if I get, you know, a couple volunteers and I own my own camera and we shoot like in my house or somewhere else that's free to use, then the cost won't be so substantial. It'll just be me basically volunteering my time, which obviously could have a cost to it, but to me it's like, well, I have that to give. Yeah. Um, So... A lot of my projects were have been created that way, so I haven't had to spend a lot of money. I've been fortunate where the one like the projects where I've needed a budget to work with, you know, I've worked with different organizations at times, nonprofits, of huge resource, which I tell people about, which they don't always realize is um, go to universities. I've had a lot of luck like working with local universities, whether it's in Santa Fe or here in Albuquerque, and saying, like, can I use your equipment if like your students come and work on my project? Um, You know, they get hours, they get, you know, experience, that sort of thing. And so it's been a trade-off. And Mm -hmm. so it's like, you know, I don't feel bad about giving away that secret. If someone else wants to use that secret out there, go Mm -hmm. ask the universities for help, please do it. Because they're awesome and they really, it's a cool way to get, you know, really good quality equipment and, Mm -hmm. and really good quality um, crew yeah. for you know nothing basically right, yeah. resourceful yeah <laughs> you, we like need the experience yeah, exactly. it's perfect yeah. Exchange, give and, take. and as far as looking at like the like the state of like our our tax initiatives when it comes to the larger industry here um it definitely i think there is a definite benefit in getting projects here when we tell when we can tell you know huge projects like well you get a 25% tax credit you know you spend 10 million dollars you get 2 million dollars back you know in credit that sort of yeah. thing i think that's a big deal um for the larger productions it does take a little bit of learning 
if you're not experienced being a producer to learn how to take advantage of those um, credits if you're just like someone like me who's just kind of I still consider myself starting out even though I've done yeah. this 10 years because my company is small um, and so it still takes you still have to kind of learn the process of okay what do I need to do you know how do I need to prove that I'm spending the money here what kind of accounting do I need that sort of thing to really take advantage of it but it is open to anybody there is no um, there is no cutoff for like how you qualify for those rebates as long as you're making the project here in New Mexico you can take advantage of it um, so that's really nice I think that I think there was when you hear in the news you always hear this kind of like way that it's kind of portrayed that it's if we're giving tax credits we're taking money away from like education we're taking money yeah. away from like school kids and I think there's a fundamental like error in that that people don't the general public doesn't understand that the tax credits don't take anything away mm -hmm. like the tax credits are it's basically just like a discount yeah. yeah like if you went into a store to buy a shirt that was ten dollars and they were giving you a twenty five percent discount it's not like you could just walk into the store and say give me two dollars and fifty cents without spending the money they're not yeah. just going to give you the money free you have to spend it first right and so i think a lot of times there's there's you know an error that's put out there a factual error that we're losing money with the tax incentives um, and we really aren't. They really are a good thing. I think that quietly, it's interesting that you see the current governor. Uh, you know, at first when she was was running, um, you know, I guess six years ago, whenever her first her first term in office, it was mm -hmm. so like against the film incentives. And now, as you see, like the last couple of years, the film industry has made so much money that she's just kind of quiet about it now. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, we're not going to like pick on the incentives yeah. anymore. And it's just good. And it, I mean, I don't really care too much about it, like, f because it's my industry. Any industry, I feel, that would, you know, s help our state grow, brings funds in, brings education, brings jobs in, um, is a good thing. And so, you know, I, I also, being in New Mexico, even though I kind of keep to myself a little bit within the industry, I also want to be an advocate and say, you know, support creatives, support you know, industries that are growing and continue to can be something that's like a bright spot for our state. Um, and awesome. I and I hope that the film industry will continue to be that. Yeah, well, you, know. you could totally be the inspiration. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. totally great. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. could. So we got a couple live Periscope questions. Uh, for those of you that have asked, thank you. Um, so the first one for you would be, um, are you hiring assistants? That's a very good Someone question. Wants a job. I know that's a good question. So um, I always I get eh, from time to time I'll get people contacting me and you know saying like if you need help on projects you know please keep me in mind and that sort of thing and so I have a database of people in mind that like okay strangers basically yeah. people I don't know yeah. that have expressed an interest in some way or another um, and usually as I said since I, I work kind of small I don't always have a big need for other help right. but I'm trying to be more conscious of that now yeah. that now that. I've been doing this long enough that I'm not just having to worry about just getting a project done. I can also focus now on getting a project done and mentoring and, and you know yeah. helping other people out that um, I want to start being able to involve more people. I don't know if it'll be in sort of a intern, non-paid or paid yeah. way. Um, again, I'm, I don't, most of my projects are involved. I don't have a lot of budget and I like to keep it that way. Um, but I'm always like open to meeting new people and seeing what their interests are and seeing if I can I help them out. So if anybody is interested, and I'm not used to usually talking directly at camera, yeah, so right, I can talk to I them so yeah. much. If anybody is interested, though, they can contact me via my website. Uh, we are incredible.com or on any of the social media sites. Um, and we can just start a dialogue that way. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So we got two more questions. Um, the next one is, how do you market your films? Great question. Um, I think that's always a challenge too, is to get eyeballs on it for whatever you create as an artist. And that's another thing that I'm not great at, and I totally will recognize it because I understand that I like to spend more of my time in the actual production and conception of stuff. Um, and then kind of when a piece is out there, in a weird way, it may sound weird to some people, I don't really care what happens to it. Because yeah. for me, my joy exists personally in the creative process. Right. And when it's done, it's like, okay, well, it's on to the next thing, sort mm -hmm. of thing. So when it comes to marketing my work, um, I sort of, I stick to kind of, I don't know about the major social media sites. They're always changing, obviously, as you all know, and what you do. Um, but all like, you know, I'm on Vimeo and YouTube and Facebook. Those are kind of the main 
the main sort of um, entities I use, at least when it comes to sh sharing my, my film work. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of my film work I'll distribute for free. It's usually yeah. my features are the only thing that I can't like right away distribute for free because I have to wait to see if we're going to get distribution or see if we get any film festivals. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll market, I'll market as much as I can there within my, my social networks and within you know family, friends, telling people, you know, see this, watch this, that sort yeah. of thing. Um, and then hopefully to... I kind of chose projects, at least at this point in my life, for my short stuff that I know will have a sort of built-in audience. Like I'll do a short about the balloon fiesta where I'm like, okay, well, at least cool. once a year yeah. there's going to be a huge like, you know, spotlight on the balloon yeah. fiesta. Mm -hmm. Or I do a lot of work, um, as you all mentioned in, in my intro, I, my newest film is called Siempre Flamenco. I do a lot of work with local flamenco dancers and there's a huge following here in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. So. You know, if you have that subject matter, a lot of the marketing is done for you mm -hmm. because it's already a popular subject and right. then those entities yeah. share exactly. your work. Yeah. So that's really nice. Mm -hmm. If you can have partnerships, if you can have collaborations with people who already have huge like networks, then I'm like, thank goodness, yeah. like, I don't have to <laughs> don't do it. Like that. I don't I have like seven friends. I think I have like seven hundred Facebook friends, like fifteen of them are actually people I like know yeah, and talk mm -hmm. to on the same time. So it's nice when you can kind of piggyback Mm -hmm. on other movements, causes, organizations to help market the work. Mm -hmm. And then it always helps reviews, you know, that sort of thing help mm -hmm. for the larger, for the longer stuff. Or getting to a film festival always kind of helps get the word out. Um, but it's really just the advice I give when it, whatever it is, if you're trying to be seen as, you know, figure out the audience that you want to speak to and go directly to them, whatever yeah. that way mm -hmm. is. It may not be for me like a theatrical run. It may not mean like I throw my film in a theater. Maybe mm -hmm. I distribute it this way yeah. or I have a targeted screening, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, you just have to be much more targeted with how you market your work. Exactly. That's yeah. awesome. Cool. So we have one last question. You guys, if you have more questions, feel free to ask. Keep them coming. Yeah. I like this. Keep them coming. Awesome. It's fun. I love yeah. this live totally aspect fun. of it. This is great. Yeah. Okay. So the last one is what, made it, what, motiva bleh, bleh. what motivates <laughs> you to keep going in your career? Um, that's a good, that's a really good question. I think yeah. that's always like a really deep question for artists in general or, or creators in general because like there's some very apparent things to them like, well, I enjoy it. I enjoy yeah. the work and so I want to continue doing it. I'd rather do that than another job, you know, that isn't for me. Um, so I think there's an aspect of that. I think an aspect also for, for me particularly and other artists is like you don't want to be forgotten. So it's like your way of feeling you're making an impression in the world. Yeah. Like, you know, when you're gone that you're creating a body of work or something that spoke about your time, you know, and you and who you were like. So I think that also motivates me. Um, I'm also very motivated about just doing new things. Uh, I mean, I'm very conscious now, and I guess I always have been about my brand, not so much in a way of selling my brand, mm -hmm. but what what is a Christopher Michael Roy Ball product like? You know, mm -hmm. what are the themes that are common? And for me, I like to say my themes in all my work are very common. They're love, loss, family, and culture. Very, very mm -hmm. simple universal themes. So I'm very like conscious of creating a body of work, whether it's in film or photography. I also, I also paint. Um, I also do different things that all kind of are around those themes. It's almost like building a movement yeah. in yeah. a sort of like fairy tale, but romantic way. It's building a movement around this work. So that's what motivates me as well, is to just create in the hope of, of putting something positive out there. Because yeah. we have a lot of negative, we have a lot of ambivalence, and mm -hmm. so for me it's like, okay, well, you know, if you're going to say you believe in something, you know, you should do it. Right. And so my way of doing it is putting into my art, and so that also motivates me. And then just not to be idle. I think, like, <laughs> yeah. that comes from my family, though. I see, like, my father my grandfather was like, they were always were working, working, working in different ways. For them it was like raising cattle and farming and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But for me, even though I still like didn't want to work, work, work growing up, I yeah. find myself, well, I can't stop to a degree. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I want to continue to make stuff and just, you know, not waste my time if I have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Especially when it's something you love. Mm -hmm. you yeah, it's, 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 I mean like that whole, that old cliched saying or whatever, you know, if you do something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Like there's a lot of truth to it yeah. because it is. I'm experienced it. You know, I've been doing this 10 years now. Uh, yeah, I guess 10 years. I graduated from college about 10 years ago this May. And so I I look back on it. And the one right decision I've made throughout my old 20s and adulthood has been pursuing my art. I may have messed up everywhere else yeah. at times. <laughs> but at least that, because I cared about it, I, I'm very happy that I was able to do it. And I'm continuing to being able to do it. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, so in terms of finding actors and crew members, where do you go? Do you just focus on the universities or hire friends or put out casting calls? How does that work? Yeah, a little everything. Yeah. That's a good question. For me, I believe like that anybody could be in something I do. Mm -hmm. I always tell people I'd rather work with really good people than really good actors mm -hmm. or really good people rather than really good crew. So it matters to me the quality of a human being I'm working with because you have to spend a lot of time. Yeah. You have to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, and, hope, and I also believe that your team, like the energy and the integrity you build to it, it'll come through in your final project. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not always true. Sometimes you can be the most magnificent artist in the world and you know, it could have been made, your project could have been made in like the worst circumstances. Like The Revenant, the movie that just came out, yeah. The Revenant, you know. Mm -hmm. Like you hear every story from everybody who was on set, they really hated making that movie. <laughs> yeah. They may put on a brave face come mm -hmm. Oscar time, they're trying to get awards, but like everybody hated making that movie. It was torture. Mm -hmm. But they still came out really good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, I, if any of, if you probably asked any of them, you know, whoever it is, cast, crew, you know, if they'd want to do that same thing again, I can. I don't want to guarantee that no one would say no. Yeah. I'll never do it again. Yeah. But from having done this, I know that you know there's certain projects. Even if it comes out really well, you're like, no, nah, I don't want to do it because the integrity wasn't there, or right. the team wasn't you know as tight or as you know right on chemistry. top of it. And yeah. so, so when it comes to that, I at this point in my career, I first and foremost like to work with you know friends, family, mm -hmm. you know acquaintances that I meet and like I gel with in some way. Yeah. Um, I do I do do casting calls if I need a lot of people I'm just be, I'm just like starting to prepare to do a, a casting call for my newest project that'll be coming up yeah. um but I'll just and that's mostly because like all my friends and, <laughs> I know right casting call if anyone's interested <clears throat> but the only reason I'm kind of doing that is cuz like I realize like all my friends and family who I would want to put in it just right. don't fit for the parts uh, right now yeah. so <laughs> it's one of those things and so so I I, just, I look everywhere mm -hmm. and I think that when it comes to filmmaking you can't be so don't be so blind to think just you only have to hire someone who calls himself an actor or right. someone who calls mm -hmm. himself a, a cinematographer mm -hmm. or a director. You all, those qualities, everybody person has those qualities. Now I may make a better director than a lot of people simply because that's my personality. Just yeah. as much as someone might make a better teacher mm -hmm. than me because that's their personality or a better, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but just when you're, when you're recruiting help, don't be so blind to think like I have to just do it one particular yeah. way mm -hmm. um, because you limit yourself that way right. and you may not discover something that's new that really works for Definitely. you yeah. um, so when it comes to finding talent I just really am trying to be open mm -hmm. a lot I, I, I do have to admit though at this point in my career I really want to work more with friends and family just because it's more worthwhile to me mm -hmm. um, and yeah I guess that's yeah, yeah that, that's a question <laughs> yeah. yeah so besides <laughs> producing films you've, you've also done photography web series and written a few books so could you tell oh, us yes. about some of your most significant projects and what you're currently working on. Yeah, so I guess I do do a lot. As I said, I try to stay very busy, and so I writing is my passion. Shows. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> writing is my passion, and so like it all begins through that. And so when I when writing, I apply that to my films, which I write and produce and direct. And then I've also written, I think I've written and self-published five books um, for our our poetry collections. Because for me too. When writing all began, when I first started writing, I first started writing poetry. It was like writing poetry in sixth grade to get girls. That was the first reason. That's the story. Did it work? Yeah, it did. In sixth grade, it did. Yeah. And so, like, that's how it all started. It's like the the story I tell all the time about how I got into writing. And so, for me, poetry was kind of my favorite way of writing. It probably is the way that's still most precious to me. It's probably what I do the least, but because I only do it when I really want to do it, I don't force myself to do it. But that's a big part of what I do and even now like I describe my films and people say kind of what's their vision of them I, I create more visual poetry than mm -hmm. I do just straight film mm -hmm. so yeah. it's a little more avant-garde and kind yeah. of ethereal than just your like st your standard like plot A, mm -hmm. plot B, plot C yeah, happens right. um, so I yeah I write books I I do obviously I make my movies I getting much bigger into photography because I found that that makes me a better cinematographer mm, which yeah. I'm just like really into now yeah. now that I'm doing visual poetry mm -hmm. so much so like I do I do a fair share of photography a lot of for higher stuff whether it's headshots or you know baby photos or that sort of thing I just I'm about to start so I also do a lot of websites as you <laughs> mentioned I do web series 
So I also have two current web series that I have right now for a new website that I started called Viva New Mexico. Cool. And so this website is supposed to be like a culture kind of... I watched of, some of it. <laughs> good. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm always trying to get viewers because again, mm -hmm. that's the hard part. How do you find an audience? Yeah. So guys, watch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Viva New Mexico. So, I, so through Viva New Mexico, that site's about celebrating New Mexico. And so we're creating video content, web video, uh, web series content that's specifically for that. So we have like an interview show where we ask, it's called Ask a New Mexican. And we just have everyday real people people and we ask oh, them different mm -hmm. stuff about their life like what do they like about New Mexico favorite foods you know it's places kind of like to visit. humans of New York but with the New Mexico focus and yeah kind of like and we're getting New Mexico yeah, yeah, yeah really. and that's actually getting it's good that we're mentioning this because uh -huh. this is getting me to my newest kind of project so as we do that and then I have another we have a recipe show on there eat like a New Mexican or we do a little quick you know like the tasty style recipe videos of New Mexican foods. And so I also, now I've decided recently I want to start doing like a sort of humans of New York style, but for incorporating to the Viva New Mexico where I'll go out and take photos of everyday New Mexicans and situations in sort of a, a journalistic way of approaching yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if we'll ask them questions or that sort of thing, but start to show more of just, you know, New Mexico and the people of it. So that's a new project that hopefully be starting Super soon. Super cultural, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and uh, I also started another website called Film New Mexico, which is um, I'm creating a database for all films that have been created in New Mexico, like ever. So like, and it's all that's user based. So, <laughs> so hopefully, like, like it really will only grow if people will submit their films. Uh -huh and be willing to share them free online. Because we want to make one database where you can go by year, or by subject matter, um, or by format, and then just see a lot of different stuff that was made as a way of preserving the content. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like a big nerd when it comes to like archiving stuff and yeah. saving stuff. And so I feel that that would be kind of cool too. So some of the content we'll be doing through there is some film tutorials. I, I wrote a, 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 one of my books is a, is a workbook, a film workbook teaching youth or beginning filmmakers how to make a film from like idea phase to distribution in really simple ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll be doing some stuff like that and then I'll also be having, um, as I said, a feature film that I'll be, my next feature film starting hopefully in May, um, mm -hmm. at least by May with production. So I'm like writing that and thinking about casting and crew. So oh, little so of exciting. everything. Yeah, yeah so little of everything. Stuff. Yeah. Cool. So we got a couple more questions. Thank you guys so much for yeah, that's awesome. Love the engagement. Nice. Um, so wow, there's a ton of questions. I'm just yeah, try this off. is good. Go. So uh, first one is, what challenges um, does filmmaking in New Mexico present in compared to Hollywood? Um, good question, man. What challenges? I never really thought is of like challenges. Yeah. Challenges. <laughs> um, I think maybe at this point in my career, mm -hmm. I would say the challenge might be be for me finding like specialized talent. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if there's a certain type of you know, visual artist I need or a certain type of person who does whatever it is, acting or behind the, the camera, that can be a challenge just mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm pretty familiar with everybody who's, you know, working right. like mm -hmm. I do within the industry. So I know what we can do and what our limitations are and that sort of thing. So there, so, you know, at times there's like, wow, I wish there was somebody else, you know, maybe that needs to fill a hole and that sort of thing. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, I'm not too familiar with, as I said, now I think about it, I've been out of college 10 years and like everything that's changed just in technology and the way we tell stories oh in God. that much time yeah. is crazy. So I'm like looking forward to it of, of kind of discovering, you know, all y'all, you guys and your peers and the abilities that you all bring because I think that will bring a new influx of talent um, to, to New Mexico film that I'm not familiar with at this current mm -hmm. point. Yeah. And so that'll be kind of cool. So I think that's a challenge for me right now as far as, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Other than that, making films in New Mexico isn't challenging. It's actually quite easy compared to like LA and New York mm -hmm. because most people There's less won't, competition. Yeah, and they won't give you like a hard time. Like yeah. they'll just let you come and film in their restaurant or whatever. They won't charge you like a million dollars like if you're in LA, so yeah. yeah. That's cool, okay, awesome. Next one is, how important is technology in filming? I'm assuming kind of important, but I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that I would say is a constant, like ongoing thing that I think about um, is the importance of staying current with the technology um, or just kind of doing it my own way. And so, that like, applies to any field, really. It does, and I think especially now because of how quick technology is advancing compared to like the last hundred years. Oh. I mean, at least in filmmaking, there was basically everybody shooting on film from its inception until yeah. the nineties. But now it's, everything's becoming digitalized, and and very very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so with that, you know, every month there's a new camera, there's a new you know specs on something coming out, and so everything right now the big buzz is obviously like 4K when it comes to cameras or drones. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. another oh, one. That's question. A big one. Those yeah. are the two main yeah. popular. Technology, yeah. mm -hmm. and so, like, 
there's always like you have to think about that as a creator like well do I want to invest in what's new right now yeah. knowing that what's new right now is going to change or something <laughs> else might come <laughs> out or do you sort of you know as I've done hedge your bets and so like for me I've tried to over the course of my career buy equipment that would you know service me may not be like making the most 3D Avengers mm -hmm. type stuff, but that's not my projects. Right, but right. at least would service me that I could do a lot of different yeah. things. Quality investments. So mm -hmm. I've invested in like, let's say cameras, for example. Over the course of my career, I've had three different cameras. Mm -hmm. um, they're all Canon. I just have been using Canon brands and now I'm just like, okay, I like them. And I do research and other stuff, but I, I, I kind of like the picture quality and that sort of thing. And so like my newest, when I was buying my newest camera, which was about a year and a half ago, it was like, okay, do I buy 4K? Do I make mm -hmm. the investment and do something like that, or do I not? And I ultimately decided to buy a camera that wasn't 4K, but that provided me with the technology I needed to do everything that I enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. Not right. that was like, yeah. you know, I said, it, that was hypothetical going to give me all these abilities, but mm -hmm. was for the work I do. And for the work I do is very, as I said, it's kind of one man, simple, it's very journalistic. Mm -hmm. So I wanted a camera that would, you know, support me in that endeavors. And I ultimately got a Canon C100 because in my research and looking at cameras, I thought this, this suits me. This is all manual stuff. It's quick running gun. Um, it's simple. It's more cost effective. <clears throat> I mean, even these cameras, when I say cost effective, it's still 5,000 new, and you can be spending, you know, 10, 15, yeah. 20, up to 100 grand on these cameras mm -hmm. if you purchase them, which for my living, I don't, I doesn't support that because right. I don't work as a full-time cinematographer. Mm -hmm. um, and so the technology, you know, that I use is right for me. And that's the advice I give anybody is find, you know, don't be nearsighted and say, I need just this piece for this piece, like for this project I'm doing, and then it becomes obsolete. Right. But at least be kind of current and look, you know, a couple years down the line, two to five years, I would say, yeah. and think if I'm using this piece of equipment for two to five years, will it support me? Will it still keep me current? You know, do I have to be worried about, you know, falling behind and then not being, you know, hired mm -hmm. or not being, you know, like making a product that doesn't look good? Um, and in the case of, of the stuff I've chosen, I've realized that, you know, five, four or five years from now, I'll be okay. 4K is not taking over. Like it, it's just not within you know five to ten years. There's just too much that has to change with um, the size of the files has to get much smaller. Everybody has to buy a 4K TV, which is not going to happen within yeah. you know in the next mm -hmm. year or so. So it's those things that you have to keep in mind. Um, and it, it's 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 very very important. I think that when I first started, it wasn't as important. It was just like give me a camera, I'll point and shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now it's like okay, everything. The techno techno yeah. technology always plays a huge role in the decisions I make about where I'm going um, mm -hmm. next, I guess. That's cool, though, because, I mean, yeah. you can apply it to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So, two more questions. I'll just ask them back to back. Okay. Um, what's your favorite project you've worked on? And also, this is a little uh, random one. Have you watched Pink Flamingo, and what do you think? Hmm. Pink Flamingo? I don't think so. I'm trying to think of that, really which piece heard. that was. I don't was. think I know what that is. Yeah, me neither. But I the only thing I can think like... of Pink Flamingo is like a John Waters movie. And if that's what you're talking about, then okay, I haven't seen it. And if it's not what you're talking about, I probably haven't seen it either. Because I keep a list of every film I've ever seen in my life. Oh. And I know that's not on there. Yeah. Again, I'm big on like archiving and that sort uh -huh. of stuff. So it's like... How long is this list? I'm yeah. I, I think it's around like 2,000 titles. Oh, like I didn't watch as many... I wasn't a huge... I enjoyed movies growing up, but it wasn't like my thing. As I uh -huh. said, I basically decided I want to make films yeah. when I was 18. And I'd watch a lot, but... So, so is that so when you started them, the list, when you were 18? Yeah, when I was like 18, I decided, let me go back and write every movie I've seen and then add to it. And so that's kind of how my mind sort of works. I don't really forget anything if I don't choose to forget it. Uh -huh. And so I made that list. And now I, I average between like 120 and 140 new movies a year that I watch. Wow. And that's not counting like other stuff, but... Um, in any case, so yeah, there's that pink flamingo question. Um, <laughs> so, and then the other piece, the other question. The other was the question equipment. was, let's Oh, my see. first, pro my favorite project yeah, your I've favorite worked project, on. Yeah, favorite project, Um, that's a tough question because I think if you tend to romanticize your work in the way that I do, like, you kind of find you know, something to like about everything that you've done or everything well, I've done. Well, you're going to have to. You're not going to put out work that you hate. So. Yeah, I mean, there is there is points like that because, like, I have, there's one film that sticks out that I've done that was, like, in many people regard probably as my best film. It's a short film called Amado, and it's really good. And it bugged me that it was so really good that people thought because I, as I was saying earlier, like, really? I broke all my rules when I made it. Like, I didn't think... 
I was in the right mindset to do it and that sort of thing. And I rushed it and I made it for all these reasons that like I, I teach my students not to like make films yeah. for. I also mm -hmm. teach film in different schools and stuff. So when I te teach, that's what I mean. That's my next question. So. Um, and so, <laughs> so like I broke all my rules and the piece still came out good. So that really bugged me. So when I look back and say like, is that my favorite experience? It wasn't. It wasn't in the fact, I really enjoyed it because it taught me my abilities, even when I was in the right mindset, but it wasn't my most fun time. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. when I all look back on it, probably my favorite time is still probably my first film. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that would be true to many filmmakers, if they're going to say their first <laughs> film was their favorite one, but I think there's something because when you go and do something f like, and you don't know any better necessarily as a filmmaker, and you just jump in and try to get something done, it comes out. However good or bad it is, at least you did it. Yeah. And so for right. me, jumping in and making my first short film called Our First Goodbye in 2005, I think that holds a special place for me. And then, but then it's like, well, my first feature I did, that was huge. I remember that when it was premiering at the National Hispanic Culture Center here in town, because that's where I like to premiere all my films, like just crying for like the first 10 minutes, like so <laughs> oh. happy, like overwhelmed by it. Um, and so everything was like, you know, very special. And then you look at my newest film, Siempre Flamenco, I'm really proud about that because I set out to accomplish some things technically and, and artistically at the beginning and it really came out well. Like it's a very strong film, at least for what I wanted to create. Right. So I feel like, you know, if I'm judging myself and how much I've grown, that this is a really good film to show that. So that's mm -hmm. also special. And I guess long story short, where this can all come from is like, hopefully if you're creating art, like if you find a reason to really care about it, like you'll always have a fond memory to look back on. Yeah. And it won't be like, well, 10 of these projects, you know, sucked. I hated them. And only one was really fun. Mm -hmm. um, if you really, again, do what you do because you enjoy it, then, you know, you'll have a lot of those experience, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So in terms of education, where do your students come from? What do you teach them? How do you teach them? What kind of demographic are these students coming from? Tell us about that. So I, about, probably about seven years ago, I got involved really wanting to teach um, particularly middle school and high school kids. That was another reason why I came back to New Mexico. I thought, okay, like I went to USC. Yes, I wanted to go to USC. I didn't settle on it. Like mm -hmm. I really wanted to go there for journalism because it had such a good journalism school. I mean, journalism school. film, I mean, USC is like one of the best. <laughs> yeah, and so I yeah. wanted to go there for that reason. But I also look at it like if I had it 10 years ago, wanted to study what I studied at USC, if I wanted to study here in New Mexico, I couldn't have. The mm -hmm. education wasn't available yet, whether it's at NMSU or here at UNM. It just wasn't there to the breadth and depth that I would have liked to. Yeah. So I had to leave. And so making a decision to come back to New Mexico, I thought, well, if I'm coming back, I want to, you know, start providing education that I didn't have mm -hmm. and help it to grow. Yeah. Because that's really the only way we're going to have a self-sustained film community mm -hmm. is if we're actually creating work here. Because there is, there is a big, I mean, a, lot, a large portion of our film industry wouldn't exist if it wasn't for stuff coming from Hollywood or from New York. Yeah because they're the ones hiring. Right. So until we can actually be the ones producing work, and when I mean producing work, I mean like writing, mm -hmm. you know, funding them, raising the dollars, raising the capital here in the state, unless we're able to do that, we're never really going to be self-sustaining. We can always be, our industry can always disappear as soon yeah. as Hollywood decides to leave. True. Mm -hmm. And so um, part of being self-sustained involves education and involves teaching other people to do what I do and what my peers do and that sort of thing. So when I started teaching, um, within nonprofits and in schools, that was kind of my goal was to mm -hmm. say, you know, just get kids excited. If nothing else, let them see that there's something different they can do. Growing up in New Mexico, at least for me in northern New Mexico, I experienced a culture, not from my parents, but I could see that a lot yeah. of other people, you know, we tend to believe that we should only do what our parents have done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, only do what our culture says is culturally acceptable here in New Mexico. And so I feel part of my teaching is to let kids know, like, well, even if your parents never made film before, it's okay. Yeah. You can at least consider it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. not something Try you have to it. feel bad yeah. about yeah. doing. If you yeah. want to leave the state to go study something, that's okay. You know, not everybody has to be a Lobo or Aggie just mm -hmm. because our parents were, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so teaching these kids over seven years, I've become a much better teacher, thank goodness. <laughs> now I'll actually say, okay, I am a film teacher. Before yeah. I wouldn't say, like, I was a teacher. I'm just like, I'm just some dude who, like, <laughs> talks to them, yeah. tries to make them <laughs> laugh, that sort of thing. Um, and so now I teach various classes, whether it's organizations or my own, through my own incredible filmmaking academy, which I'm slowly kind of developing and trying to find partnerships mm -hmm. of where I'm going to teach that class and that sort of thing to just sort of really continue to help, mm -hmm. you know, beginners know that there's 
a lot of different ways to create art and not just mm -hmm. the Hollywood way yeah. and not just one certain way. And that's been a great experience for me to teach because it always refreshes things. Mm -hmm. To see like what eighth graders think is really cool and is really mm -hmm. like, wow, that's awesome that we did that in the yeah. film. And I'm like, that was so simple though. Like <laughs> yeah. it was so straightforward. It keeps things fresh and yeah. it always reminds me, even someone of me who really enjoys what I do, mm -hmm. it refreshes and it keeps me, you know, thinking about why I do this yeah. and making sure that I'm doing it for the reasons that I feel passionate about right. and not just because I can. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, t I try to find students forever. Uh -huh. You know, I like when students are like, you know, what class are you doing and all that. You uh -huh. know, a lot of my classes only exist because there would be, or if there is a need for them, or if yeah. there is a request, and that's always a challenge too. Just like getting marketing a film, like yeah. marketing a class and letting people <laughs> know it exists is a challenge. So, if anything, you're watching Periscope, you want me to teach a class, like. I would you consider set one doing up, yeah. online classes, or do you really want to have the interaction in person with the students? There's a great benefit having in person. I like, like, a, like I was telling y'all before we recorded, like this is my first experience with like Periscope, yeah. and like really learning about the technology and the fact that we're getting live questions in is yeah. really mm -hmm. cool. Like, yeah. I like the idea of just teaching kind of a pre-recorded class. I don't mind it, but I really mm -hmm. like much more now knowing about Periscope yeah, that yeah. someone could ask questions right, and that sort of right. thing. And then, and and you know, I. When I was at USC, I actually worked within the Distance Education Network for four years in the engineering mm -hmm. school. So that's all we did was teaching online, was oh, like coordinating yeah. with the teachers to teach all over the place. So I actually have like a strange education in that yeah. because I worked there for four years. Uh -huh. So I'm considering it more and more. Yeah. And I think hopefully as I'm doing more of these web series and, and incorporating more of my teaching into them, that that will be something that, mm -hmm. you know, I want to offer for people. Because mm -hmm. it's so easy nowadays with the technology to share that way yeah. online. And there's no excuse other than just if you have a lack of time. Right. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Super cool. So. Um, before we wrap things up, uh, where do you see the future of New Mexico's creative economy going, especially in the film industry? Um, and with your influence and teaching more people, where do you see that evolving? Um, I would like to see it continue to become more self-sustaining, as I was mentioning. I would like to see us really kind of evolve um, and develop what New Mexico creative like means, like like an essence and like a flavor of its own. Carl like if niche, you yeah. yeah, like if you say New Mexico food, we know what New Mexican food tastes yeah, like compared exactly. to everything else in the world. And that's been developed over many years and mm -hmm. cultures and influences coming in. And I would like to see our creative um, economy, our creative community take those same considerations in, take our culture into account, take mm -hmm. our particular history in, from New Mexico into account, and then take our diverse population into account and say, this is what we want to create. We don't want to just be a copy of Hollywood. We don't want to just yeah. be a copy of somewhere else, another mm -hmm. film or creative center in the world, but we want to be our own and we want to do it with integrity and tell our own stories. Yeah. Um, my favorite kind of quote, if I ever quote anybody, <laughs> is a quote by a director, Fernando Medies. He's Brazilian. He mm -hmm. did like The Constant Gardener and City of God, a really great oh, director. That's my favorite movie. Yeah, it's a magnificent movie. And he always says, or he said once upon a time, yeah. speak of your village and you will be universal. Mm. And I really yeah. like that yeah. because I find that's particularly what I tried to do in coming back to New Mexico. Uh -huh. And what I think is just a good way to adapt anything you do in life, because mm -hmm. as we're seeing everywhere in this world right now, and particularly with like our current like political state, like everybody is having their voice heard in mm -hmm. a new distinct way that I think is afforded to us specifically because of our technological advancements. Mm -hmm. And because now we can have, you know, we can record ourselves, we can Snapchat, Instagram, Periscope, right. whatever yeah, it is, everything. our viewpoint, our mm -hmm. belief, what we have to teach. What, I mean, we, yeah, we have to teach what we want to learn, that sort of thing. And so when you look at any sort of economy or group like the New Mexico creative you know, community, we have an opportunity to be heard. Mm -hmm. And we hopefully will be heard in a respectful and an important and intelligent and an ethical way mm -hmm. where we'll continue to grow. And it won't just be something where Hollywood pulls their yeah. money and we disappear yeah, yeah. Exactly. because everybody has to leave. Right. Um, so I hope that we continue to go that way and to understand there isn't one right or wrong way to do it. Uh -huh. There's just our own ways to do it. And hopefully we do things because we care about it and because we're looking to make our world a better place. And if we do that, then I think we'll be in a good yeah. good yeah. place. And that's how I'm gonna continue to operate. I may not be yeah. like looking for the huge scores and to make you know the next Marvel movie, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna hopefully continue to make work that speaks to me and that I feel is strong um, in, in you know these, all these yeah. beliefs I've been rambling yeah. about for like, you know, how long it's been here today. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and 
Um, let's leave our viewers with like, what advice do you have? I mean, I know a lot of people, especially in LA, are very caught up with the idea of making it big, but for people who want to start out here in New Mexico, you know, here in the local industry, what advice would you give those aspiring filmmakers? Um, the simplest advice would go to that, to like the idea of speak of your village and you'll be universal. Think of the story that you have to tell, whatever it is, because whether you see yourself as an actor, an actress, a director, a cinematographer, you know, an electrician, whatever it is, your everybody I believe has a particular story like to them that they are more you know they can tell better than anybody else yeah, can. Right. So if you think of like the stories you want to tell, the messages you want to, you know, share with others, then think of like, well how do I want to do that? Do I want to do that via photography, via film? Do I want to do that through journalism? Do I want to do that through art? Do I want to do that through politics? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then continually ask yourself, continue to check in with yourself, what is my story? Is my story changing? Mm -hmm. Why do I care about this story? As you work, as you learn, as you gain new skills. Because that will always keep you focused. I mean, it's been very easy to me. I have, as Periscope people probably can't see, I have love tattooed on my like <laughs> wrist here because I am a very hopeless romantic. I have a heart here. It's very easy for me to remember like the main theme of most of my work or what I at least am striving to do. Yeah. And so when I drive, drive, like, you know, kind of go off course, I have to remind myself, why am I doing this? You know, And I believe that that's helped me grow much quicker than if I had all the experiences in the world mm -hmm. or you know, more education, formalized education. The, the fact that I've been able to hopefully hold on to why I'm doing it and feel passionate about it has helped me. So the best advice I would give people is just anywhere in life is you know, ask yourself, why am I doing what am I doing? Right. Do mm -hmm. I care about what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And then align those two answers you know, as best as possible. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here on the show. It was a pleasure to yeah, have thanks you. Thanks for having me. It's you so guys awesome. can check out his work at weareincredible.com. And we here at the New Mexico Newsport, we hope that you join us for our next episode here on Periscope. We will be having several other exciting guests, including two brothers from ABC Shark Tank. Yes, and we want you guys to stay connected with us. So through Snapchat, Facebook, and Twitter, we are at NM Newsport. So um, make sure you guys just keep up with our latest coverage. Again, I'm Ebony Romero. And I'm Angela Shen. Thank you for watching. Bye, Bye guys. guys.